Once it was an impossible scenario outside the scope of our imagination. The great solar flash, a darkened sun, ancient stories relived, fire from the sky. All now up for reconsideration with a scientific state of mind to prove that the evidence mounting at recurring nova in the cosmos is complementary to the stories of our ancestors and the events that walk through time to have now molded modern belief and understanding of the universe. What would the solar micronova look like if you were on the ISS staring out at the sun? The imagination wanders to some interesting places. Does the outer shell to be ejected crust up, cool, and darken before breaking out into space? Do we get any warning at all from the sun? Or does a micronova shell release begin with a flash and then fill our view with the ejection? The best evidence suggests that we could have 15 to 20 hours between the energetic flash of X-rays, extreme ultraviolet, and gamma rays, and then the arrival of the main particle burst cloud. After this, it would be a bit of luck. What hits us? What flies just past as we watch in amazement? How long before the dust clears enough for the sun to shine again? And for those who remain to feel that their worry is waning and that they can enjoy the awe of watching the material race away from them at night? What if the cloud expands so slowly that we have to watch not only in the direction of the sun, but ahead in our orbit around it at 67,000 miles an hour? If a micronova were to happen, the shock wave would be widely diverse elementally. Its temperature range and photon emission would be broad. Iron, carbon, iridium, tungsten, gold, silver, and diamonds would be amidst the hydrogen and helium. Transuranic elements pollute the ejection of dusty turbulent plasma, as well as glass beads and enormous chunks of material. In this video, we will hear from Douglas Vogt, we will explore how his ideas offer new light on Velikovsky, Carlson, Hancock, and Hapgood, and we will revisit a concept that twists the imagination. There's two events happening here. Uh, when the sun novas, it's the heat from that nova and also cosmic rays we get within eight minutes of when the sun novas. Then, now we remember for, for another 17 to 18 hours, that dust shell is still on the way. It hasn't hit until, I estimate, 17 to 18 hours after the nova. So the first thing happens is the surface is going to get melted and glazed. Ironically, the Taurus winds up saying the moon turn red. Well, yeah, turn red. It just got baked and melted. That's the glazing that Thomas Gold and others had noticed all around the place. Then the dust shell uh, hits 17, 18 hours later. Several assumptions. One, you can't assume that this dust shell is homogeneous uh, because the evidence we've seen both on the Earth and on the Moon, they have the different samples they brought back from, um, from uh, uh, Apollo 11, 16, 17, and a few others, they had different chemical compositions. It was the same stuff they found in the South Pole and other places on the Earth. So it, it's when they say it impacts uh, like another media, remember, these scientists can't think in terms of the sun knowing. What I'm trying to tell everybody, this is not an easy process that happens. It's a complicated one. It's not just the sun. It's not just that the Earth stops its rotation and the oceans keep going. It's also <clears throat> the crust of the Earth, just like the oceans, are going to start banging up against each other. So after the moon gets glazed by and melted by the sun's nova, 17 18 hours later, the dust shell comes and puts a fresh new load of dust on top of it. Remember, the, uh, the moon appeared red. It was melting. Some of those rocks may have a lot of iron in it or basalt, and they may have still been so hot that when the glass beads landed on it, they just melted. So it appears that they're, one of their main ways that they date and they track these things is through their fission tracking, but it is quite clear from the literature and from the current state of the science, that these things are all basically presuming uranium and nothing but uranium uh, in terms of the, the decaying elements. And yet we've had a couple of papers On show... Earth, that would be true. On yeah. the moon, that's not true. Yeah, because we have a couple of those papers. I think the, the most interesting one was the one called Super Heavy Elements from Extraterrestrial Sources, where they showed that uh, elements higher than number 110 were present in almost all of the samples of the moon and the meteorite when well, they could. Right? Yeah. yeah. I had that article, 
sure. I know what they are. Absolutely. Yeah. So, uh, I spent way too much time reading journal articles. Well, so I, it, is it correct to assume that if there were all of those okay. much heavier oh, elements, that their time, their dating of these things is going to be off if they're just assuming it's all uranium? Right. Okay. It's beyond that. It's beyond stupid. They have two problems. We know from samples we see on the Earth that there, and also something came back from the moon. And I remember John Lawrence said, if you have a large element compared to a small element, a, a small atom, it's going to make a different size hole and also go deeper. We see that in samples here on the Earth. You can't wind up assuming, uh, that I have samples of bone fragment, at least I cited, not not personally, there were different holes and this stuff was on the surface and there was no uranium deposits there in Mongolia. I mean, they're, they're grasping for straws because they don't know where else or how else to explain it. Here they get a sample, a matter in their hand, and they got a bunch of holes in it. A lot of the samples they're getting from um, Antarctica and other places, they don't know to try to get the fission tracks, look for fission tracks. The stuff that came back from the moon in, in, in 69 and, and through the 70s, they were smart enough to look for fission tracks, and they found plenty of them. They, in fact, all the glass beads, almost all the glass beads I know of, had fission tracks in it, and about five or six different radioactive elements. Aluminum, aluminum 26, beryllium 10, a bunch of them, that could only have been formed from a stellar nova. You know, it's, you have to have relativistic temperatures. Got it? Right. You don't have that from a volcano. You don't have that from an impact crater. For someone to say it was an impact crater, where there's no expert in that field, you should ask them immediately, what was the title of your PhD thesis? That's the point I'm trying to make to everybody. We have all been brainwashed and kept from the, the, the truth because some bureaucrats in the 50, 60s? Yeah. Uh, 58, 59, 60, when they landed the uh, on the moon and they got the samples back in 69 and and they they were scared. It was very obvious they were scared. You could tell by the journal articles of the scientists doing some of the research. They stay so far away from anything that implied that the, the sun know. But here I want to try to fix the lies that they were trying to tell us or teach us so we wouldn't come to the truth. And, and tell people really what they should be fearing. Remember, to be forewarned is to be forearmed. Otherwise, nobody's going to make it. This thing is that bad. Remember, the anthropologist said, you know, only 30 fertile females made it. Supposedly, that's what we're related to. Even if it were, they were off by a factor of 10 or 100, I can news you. That's extinction level. This particular subject crosses all religions, ethnic backgrounds, country, everything. If you're a human being on the planet and you're not a Malthusian, then you have usually an idea you want somebody to survive this thing. Got the picture? What they didn't know is they didn't know that the Earth's rotation was dependent on the Earth's magnetic field. That didn't show up until... Um, October 1968, I'm looking at the thing that I had in uh, 4C, <clears throat> the Rain Corporation and the Air Force did. But when, if you go through the, the, you know, they call it geomagnetic eccentric dipole and changes in the Earth's rotation rate, they may not have clicked. That's kind of abstract for a guy who's in the military and not trained to think maybe a little differently like the Earth. But it's there. That's what they're saying. Now, it's real possible that, yeah, somebody in the CIA told them, yeah, that's really what it is, maybe this, or maybe it's so horrible we better not think about it and we'll look the other way. Uh, we chatted a little bit about this before. What do you say? Can uh, can you make it to Observing the Frontier 2019 and help sort of make it an even more exciting event than it's already going to be? Oh, yeah. Thank you very much. hope it's not too cold there. The Sunday panel will be on Earth's catastrophe cycle and will be Mr. Vogt, Dr. August Dunning, and myself, the NOVA panel. Now let's walk down the comet and asteroid impactor rabbit hole for a minute. This would be like Graham Hancock and others you've heard about. Well, if the Sun has a micronova, 
the cloud is likely to have larger chunks of the shell. The only close images of recurring nova demonstrate that very plainly. And the nova shell is as likely, if not more, to have the spectrum of elements. Remember, it was discovered in the 90s that just the ambient solar wind contains the entire continuum of the periodic table. And we, in fact, know that the transuranic elements, those heavier than uranium, would be present as well. The entire recipe for impactor hypothesis is present with a micronova, and I submit that Carlson and Hancock should consider this an alternative successful solution to their work rather than a competing concept. This should hold especially true given that it satisfies the cycle pattern with the impactor theory. If it is not the earth but the sun that enters a dense stream every 12,000 years, then the extra material is there to be ejected. The mechanism for disruption exists, it will have the chemical signature of those solar impactors through and throughout the micronova, and it would satisfy the ancient stories of a comet or comets being involved, as well as the sun. But it should be noted that a micronova shell could look a lot like a comet if the piece is big enough. Now moving on to the planets and chaos, it must be noted that Vogt does advocate for planetary orbit disruption during the event and we know slight perturbations can lead to significant orbital instabilities, not to mention the planet-sized chunks that could be flying by as well. It's very easy to understand where those ancient stories came from. It might make sense that the stories told most by Velikovsky and Talbot earn points from this concept, especially in the latter portions of major instability. The similarities between Vogt's cosmic theater and that of Major White, Dr. Hapgood, and the fictitious Chan Thomas of the now declassified book by the CIA are surprisingly widespread from a terrestrial perspective. By the way, a couple libraries are known to have the 284-page original Chan book, but you can only get the 57-page sanitized version from the CIA. In Vogt's version of the story, the tilt does not occur, but the rotation changes, which gives us the same tsunamis and wind and earthquakes and volcanoes. I want to end with an interesting concept for the internal solar clock idea which runs counter to the mechanism needing extra material from comets or nearby planets. Since the internal structure of supernova models and variable stars have some interesting things indeed, shells upon shells appear in the models of both the more variable stars and the more energetic nova. In this animation, we have something between sacred geometry and mechanical magic preceding the slosh action of the nova. I want you to recall that the 11 and 88 year sunspot cycles have no concrete explanation from the science community. The sun just somehow does it, and nothing about a nuclear engine should perform that way. Whether you want to look at the lack of a bulge in the near-perfect sphere, or the evidence of the stars, including our sun, being chronometers of the universe, we know there is much we don't know. We do know that recurring nova are real in the cosmos, and many more are expected to join the list over the coming centuries to millennia. The sun, the Earth, the history of our species, and our fate in the future have many questions surrounding them. Still to come in this series is a deeper dive into the evidence of cycles and micronova, more from our interview with Mr. Vogt, along with ways we can track these effects and watch for the big one. While we may be left with nothing afterwards, there is no doubt that the sun, the magnetic poles, and the low-velocity zone of Earth can be monitored easily in the meantime. We'll examine what the signs might be and the critical question of severity of the event and cascading effects throughout the Earth. Eyes open, no fear. Be safe, everyone. Apollo is the second sun god, the Greek sun god. The first one was Helios, and Helios was superseded by Apollo. So here's that going to the moon with Apollo, the sun god, to collect the evidence that the sun left on the moon roughly 12,000 years ago. You know, it's, you know, they're telling us in plain sight why they created NASA and why they're going back there. It's all about the sun. That, that should be the most obvious thing to everybody to understand. They hide it in plain sight. Regarding the CIA, I feel sorry for some of the agents of today and their leadership. These decisions were made back uh, in, the, in the late 50s, and certainly when the stuff came back from the moon, they knew what they had to do. And everybody who's there now, they had no part in it. All they did was they have to follow orders. But but it's a mistake. If they try to get decent advice from a, a geophysicist or a physicist, a, a, an astrophysicist or, or an astronomer on this event or solar physicist, I have news for you. They're going to get bad advice because they brainwashed 60 years worth of scientists. 
what's that, six genera four, four, uh, three generations of scientists they've brainwashed to think the way they want. How, how are they going to get an honest answer out of them? Yeah. It's what? not their fault. This is only what they were said in the textbooks and what they were taught in front of the school. And uh, believe me, this is what they had to regurgitate to get their PhD. If they went outside the box, they never got the PhD. Simple as that.